Do men have issues? Do you have issues with men? Listen in to the tail end of a 45-minute discussion between Warren Farrell, Paul Elam, and Tom Golden. This last segment was about why many people still don't think men face hardship and discrimination. Yeah, let me add something because I'm, I'm trying to look at this through the experience of somebody who is hearing us who has never been introduced to these issues before. And there's still, in almost every new person's mind, there's still a deeper question. And that question is like, I still don't really get it. What is it, you know, men do have all the power and they do earn most of the money and they're part of the fortune, you know, they're 90% of the fortune, uh, 100 companies, CEOs, and they're, you know, they dominate Congress, they dominate the Supreme Court. So exactly what is it you people who make all the rules don't have that we're supposed to feel sorry about? I don't get it. Aren't you the rapists? Aren't you the serial killers? Aren't you 90% of the prisoners? And we're supposed to feel empathy for you? What's missing? And so these are genuine people who are new to this area who really need that question asked, I think, every time we produce something. And some of the things that are missing is that, that, that what was called power um, are... Um, our earning most of the money was not from our fathers and grandfathers perspective a form of power it was the power they forfeited to get the money to make their children's lives better a cab driver uh, who was driving a cab 70 hours a week was not saying I am earning this money to have power over my wife He's, he was earning this money even though it took power away from his life by driving a cab 70 days, 70 hours a week when he would have preferred to have been with his children. He was doing that so his child wouldn't have to drive that cab. When a person goes and is, and is working in a construction site or as a coal miner or is in an oil rig um, away from home and family, that's lonely, that's isolated, that's um, the, the, the garbage collector does not choose to, to, to does not get up at 3 or 4 in the morning in rain and sleet and snow and, and get out to um, do the garbage so he can have more power over his wife. That's power he's losing over his life in order to make his contribution, his sacrifice, his way of loving. And, these, and, and this has been translated into the culture of you make more money than women do, you must therefore have more power. Or people believe that men earn more money for the same work when in fact that is really so hurtful, not only to men, but to women who believe it, because any woman who believes that believes that she must be undervalued. If that were true, that would be exactly what it would mean. And people don't realize that when you, when you have a male doctor, yes, male doctors earn more than female doctors. That does appear to be discrimination. But, me, but doctors mean everything from general practitioner to cardiologists. It's only when you compare two cardiologists to each other that males and females earn almost the same. But yet, males still earn more. Still seems like a little bit of discrimination. But in fact, when it's male cardiologists who have worked equal numbers of years, it gets closer. When it's male cardiologists who have worked equal numbers of years, who have both worked in private practice for equal numbers of hours each week, now we're talking about close to the very same amount. So we have, we have taken statistics that have made the average man who works more hours per week, who works at more hazardous jobs, who is more willing to travel and relocate, who is more willing to make sacrifices because his sacrifices to earn money are part of what leads him to make his contribution to the family. We've ignored the fact that never married women and never who have never had children actually have out-earned never married men who have never had children since the mid-70s. And so we have, we, have not, we have not had empathy for the fact that things like the pay gap that seem like male, a male system to oppress women are, were actually a definition of the greater amount of sacrifice outside the home that men did in order to get paid without regard for what it did for them personally. Yes, well said. I would add on to that that today's world we see men as having the power because we only look at the 1% at the very top. Mm -hmm. We don't look at the 10 to 15 percent at the bottom that's also yeah. almost all males. 
So yes, you're right. only looking at one side. You're only seeing one half of the story. And I think that's a part of the problem that we've been through for the past 50 years is we're only hearing half the story. When you only hear half the story, you don't get the whole picture. Yes. And what a voice for man and what a myth for the myth of male power, all of those things are doing is starting to tell the other side of the story, yes. you know, which is just what needs to be told. Yes, and um, the other I side of the best... More, Tom. I, I think Warren described it very well. The, the, the most difficult nature of our work is in overcoming this huge variety of myths about power, about men and women, about our roles in society. I, I think my final thoughts on this is that, that I think the biggest myth that we need to overcome is the myth that men's pain does not matter, that it is a sign of their masculinity and, and their worth that they take their suffering in silence and that they put their neck on the chopping block voluntarily and without complaining. Um, this is something that is so destructive. When we look at the, the disparity in the suicide rate between men and women, when we look at the, the amount of workplace mortality that, that happens with men, when we look at so many of these problems and even we have problems with men who, who don't seek medical attention for problems and our society actually chastises them like they're inferior because they don't value themselves enough to go see doctors. Yeah. Our biggest myth, I think, is, is in overcoming the idea that men aren't human beings, that they're appliances to be used. Yeah. And we really need to overcome that because, you know, when, if I peel back my skin, I don't see gears and wires. There's flesh and blood there. There's nerve endings. Uh, but we actually do live in a world that, that in many ways prefers that men view themselves and each other in a utilitarian way. And I think we need to, to overcome a lot and give men. I, I totally support and agree with the, the fact that, that, especially by the 1960s, we had managed to advance to the level that women uh, needed more options in their life. They needed more choices. That was an important societal change to happen. But a lot of this happened with men sort of standing there looking the other way, as though they weren't a part of this. Mm -hmm. And they've continued on in that utilitarian role for 50 years now, uh, not noticing that, that the world has changed. And that they, too, have options for self-valuing, for re, uh, looking at themselves in a different context than maybe they ever had before. Yeah, and I sure. would argue that the first place we probably need to go with that is to understand that men are human beings, they have value, and they deserve our compassion, and they deserve to have choices in their life. Absolutely. We have to look at, as Tom was saying, not just the glass ceilings, but also the glass cellars. And Paul, I think as you were saying, we have to look at men just not only as human doings, but also as human beings. And 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 doing that, we open ourselves up to the 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 deep investment that every society has in men's disposability. And when you feel when you ha when you survive because somebody else is willing to die, like in war then that you are immune to the pain of the people who are dying because you have an investment in their w being willing to die. Yes. Uh, you, give them, you give them things in exchange for this. You say, I will build a statue. I will remember you in a history book. But if you look at that from another perspective, that building of the statue or remembering you in a history book is a bribe to be a willing to die so that I can live. Now, and that's the deep... That's the deep stuff underneath it all, which yes. <clears throat> if we don't look at that and confront that, if we do look at men as human beings, we would suddenly say, my goodness, male-only draft registration, that's totally unconstitutional. It violates the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection of the Laws Clause for both sexes. Why is nobody even questioning that? Because at such a deep level, we don't question male disposability. And until yes. we do that, nothing else will make very much sense. Yep. And maybe that's a good place to stop right there, Warren. Well mm -hmm. said. And gentlemen, I've really enjoyed tonight's discussion, and I hope we can do this again sometime. Absolutely, Tom. I'd love it's, to. Thank Paul, you both just for a, being here. A real pleasure meeting you in this venue, and I look forward to meeting you in my home next week.
Uh, likewise, I'm lo very much looking forward to it, and I'm very honored to have met you today. And I promise you, I'm going to be pestering you to sign my copy of Method Mail Power. <laughs> it won't require pestering. It'll be a, it'll be a pleasure. Fair enough. We'll see you, gentlemen. Good night.